Timothy chapter 4, and I'll ask if you don't mind, maybe a good opportunity to stretch a little bit. Uh, stand with me if you would, as we read just a few verses here, and uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and uh, I'm going to start reading in verse number 1, and we'll read down to verse number 7. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. By the way, I, I think we might be there. <laughs> I think we might be there as far as prophecy is concerned. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I like what he says here, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept... The faith. I, I do want to call your attention to verse 2. It says this again, preach the word. I want to talk to you this morning about why you need Bible preaching. Why you need Bible preaching. Brother Wayne, if you would, open us up in a word of prayer. Ask the Lord to bless this. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you uh, that we're able to, uh, to read your word today, Father. There's millions of people around this world that can't read, Father. Every one of us has had the opportunity to learn and Yet, Lord, we, uh, we find excuses not to read your word, Lord, and it's precious and it's uh, needful, and Lord, we can't live without it. But Father, I pray you put a desire in everybody here that uh, from, from here on out, Lord, to, to feed themselves with your word, Lord, and, and Father, again, I pray you bless Pastor Adrian as he's preaching. Lord, help our minds to be uh, focused on the message. Help us not to be distracted with uh, thoughts of what's coming up this week. Mm. Father, we thank you again just for the, the time and, and, and moment we have before us. And we ask your blessing upon it, for it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I want to call your attention down there, if you would, to verse number 7, or verse number uh, 6. Look what Paul says. He says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Guys, he's not just talking about leaving in a boat somewhere. <laughs> he's not just talking about taking a trip. He's talking about going home to glory. Amen. And, and, and he's talking about going home, the final homecoming. He's getting ready to die is what he's doing. Now, now let me ask you a question. Have any of you, I don't need a raising of hands, but if you've ever done a last will and testament, is it not a sobering thing? Is it not a sobering thing to look at the end of your life and define what, and declare basically to all those around you in your family, your friends, what it is you leave behind for them? What it is you want them to have from you? What it is you want them to remember you for? That's a big deal. Paul is at the end of his life. He's basically saying, hey, guys, I'm going to die. I know my time is short. And think about this. I mean, most of us, we'd be thinking about what to do with the house, and the kids get this much, and they get this much. You know what Paul was worried about? He was worried about a young man knowing that it was his responsibility to preach the word of God. That tells me it was very important to Paul. Listen, uh, Paul wasn't worried about a physical inheritance. He was worried about a spiritual one. And before he went home, he said, Son, Timothy, there's something you need to know. You need to know to preach the Word of God. Why? Because God's people need it. Doesn't the Bible, after all, say, How shall they call on Him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they what? Hear without what? A preacher. And, and can I say this today? Can I say that many people today do not value preaching at all? I am thankful to be in a church where I believe God's people value it. But, but can I encourage you today, what I want you to understand is this is not a religious exercise. This is not what we do because we're independent Baptists. This is not just a, a, a tradition of some sort. This is biblical, and God had it ordained, and he wants it for your life. You need Bible preaching. I want you to look at this. Look at verse number one. I want to give you some reasons why you need Bible preaching. Number one, can I say this? God ordained it. There's a commission for it. Look at verse number one. Paul says to Timothy, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, I charge thee, therefore, before God. You know what that is? That charge is like a commission. It's what happens when the guys graduate from boot camp. Brother Wayne, you remember that? 
When you got into the, he's like, oh, yeah, I remember that. Boot camp in the military. You know what that is? Once you finish that training, you are sent off with a charge to defend your nation against, for, uh, against enemies both foreign and domestic, right? That's a charge. That is a commission. You know what God has commissioned for the church? Preaching. Preaching. Listen, I want you to understand, this is not some new, new thing. This is not, hey, this is, okay, the order of the church is this. And I, like I said, I think maybe during announcements or even in Sunday school, people have oftentimes, I remember one time someone said, so, so what do you have at your church? Man, we preach the book. And they go, well, what else do you got? Hey, man, what else do you need? <laughs> if you don't have preaching of the word of God, you can have programs and monuments in a great building, but you have nothing. Let me, let me explain this to you, by the way. The job of church on Sunday morning is not to constantly over and over and over just preach the gospel. That is great. If there's someone here that's lost today, I pray you get saved today. That's my prayer. That's my desire. But you don't understand what the church is for? It's to edify God's people, to build them up, to strengthen them so they can go out and do something for God throughout the week. How do you do that without preaching? It's impossible. Listen, I want you to look at John chapter 21. I want you to remember that when Peter was confronted with the Lord after his resurrection, and the Lord confronts Peter. Now, everybody remembers Peter denied the Lord three times, right? So Peter is confronted with the Lord, and the Lord wants to talk to Peter. And, and this is a real special event because, after all, the way that, that the Lord connected with Peter the first time was through a fisherman's net. And so this last time he connects with Peter, he does it the same way. He tells them to throw the net on the right side of the ship, and they catch 153 fishes. And so John says, hey, Peter, by the way, the guy that told us to do that, on the coast, that's the Lord. So Peter swims to shore, and he sits down. The Lord's about to feed him, and he's talking to Peter. Look at verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Verse 16. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time. You know where this is going, right? Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said to him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest I love thee. Jesus said to him, fine, feed my sheep. <laughs> you say, what is that? Listen, the sign of an apostle that loved the Lord, the sign of a man that loves God, who is called of God, is, if he's called to preach the word of God, is to feed the sheep. You know what? If I love the Lord, you know what a test of my love is? That I'm feeding God's sheep. <laughs> That is a, guys, think about this. If God would earmark something as a sign of love for him, I would say it's important. He says to feed the sheep. You know what happens toward the end of Peter's life? As he's getting to put off his earthly tabernacle, as he says, you know what he tells us that those people that are listening? Feed the flock of God, which is among you. How did they do that? Through preaching. Through preaching. You know what Paul says when he's about to say goodbye? Same thing. Look at Acts chapter 20. Paul's about to go, and, and he's about to get on a ship, and he's about to say uh, goodbye to some friends uh, there in, uh, in Ephesus. And as he's saying goodbye to the elders there in Ephesus, Paul is saying, listen, guys, uh, there's something that you need to be aware of. There's something that you need to do because there's going to come a time when people in leadership in churches, pastors and preachers and leaders, will no longer want to preach the word of God. They will want to soothe people's ears. They'll want to tell them what they want to hear because they'll want a crowd over the spirit of God being in that place. Listen, it is not my responsibility to know what you like. It's not. My responsibility is to feed you the Word of God and let the Spirit of God minister to you. You know how many churches are started anymore? They go into a neighborhood, knock on a door, and they go, okay, what do you like in church? Let's take a survey. Okay, so you like a coffee bar in the front? Okay, we'll do that. By the way, I sort of like that idea. Leave that one alone. Coffee's okay. All right. Oh, you like, you like this? Okay, we'll do that. You don't like a, a sermon that goes over 30 minutes? Well, we'll never do that. And, and you don't like preaching that's personal and about sin and controversial? Hey, we can take care of that too. Come on to church. That is not a church, guys. That's a social club. And what God's people need more now than ever before is Bible preaching. Look what Paul says here in Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves... 
and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. To do what? To feed the church of God. To feed them that sweet manna that fell down from heaven that God gave us to instruct us in our lives. This is what you need. Listen, I'm not against programs. I'm not against all kinds of activities. But I'll say it all centers on this. Let me ask you, what is your attitude towards preaching? The apostles were commissioned to preach. What about John the Baptist? Man, you talk about, think about people that God used. I mean, think about them. You know what they were? They were not sophisticated, eloquent, a flowery speech type, type, type of guys. They were preachers. I mean, guys, just imagine this. Imagine somebody walks through the back door, and I say, repent. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You know what you guys would say? Pastor Adrian has lost his mind. Right? You know who did that? Yeah, amen. <laughs> lost his mind. Because the sheep. No, I'm just kidding. You know, you, know, you know what you would think to that? You think that's, that's crazy. You know what John the Baptist said? He did that. He was a preacher. Can I say this? People talk about, you know, John the Baptist and the great man he was and these different preachers in the Bible. And I've heard, I've heard guys, listen, I'm not trying to be mean or throw stones here. But I've heard guys who basically their idea of, of feeding the church of God is sitting up here, sitting on a stool like a psychologist. Guys, we're not a preacher is not called to psychologically reason with you. That is not preaching. It's not biblical. A guy sit up there and basically have his, his little coffee table, his cup of coffee, sit on the stool, say, let's talk about this. Hey, you know what you don't find in the early church? You don't find that. You know what you find? You find preachers who preach the word of God. Can I tell you why some people don't want to do it? Because it might offend people. When you open up this book and you go from cover to cover, someone might say, I don't like that. But listen, I am called to preach the whole counsel of God for your sake. <laughs> Paul says before he goes, feed the flock of God. John the Baptist, when he shows up, he preached. The Bible says in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. It doesn't say that he counseled. It doesn't say he psychologically reasoned. He preached. People say oftentimes, I just don't think a preacher should get loud. Have you ever read your Bible? <laughs> Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Cry and spare not. That's in there. Do you ever consider this? When Jesus Christ is preaching the Beatitudes, as we call them, the Sermon on the Mount, you know how people are there? A lot of people are there. Can you imagine him saying, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed <laughs> are the pure in heart. Now listen, I think, I'm not being blasphemous here. I'm just trying to get you to consider what's out there and what calls itself preaching. Listen. God called me to preach. And God has called his people to hear the preaching of the word of God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You say, well, I think it's sort of crazy to build a church out of preaching. Hey, listen, there's no other biblical way to do it. That's how the church is built. It's, pre it's built on the preaching of the word of God. You say, well, it just doesn't make sense to me. There's got to be another way. There are. There's about a million other ways. They're just not biblical. There's a, look, you can go out there and find and shop, and you'll find there's all kinds of different methods and things. Guys, I read in 1991, this church wanted to find a different way to reach the young people. Guys, can I say this? Young people are young people for a while, and then they grow up, right? So why in the world would you change your method every five years? Listen, if I try to reach the postmodern age, you know what I would do? I would never open up that book. I would constantly just reason with them and ask them what they learned for this week on Facebook. That's what I would do. But that is not what I'm called to do. And it's not biblical. And you know what young people need? They need truth. Amen. Guess what old people need? They need truth. Guess what everybody in between needs? They need truth. Amen. It is not a matter of finding a different way or a unique way. This church thought of a, a unique way to do this. They, they paid for 10 of their staff members to get trained by WWF wrestlers so they could have a church wrestling night to bring in the masses. And at the end of it, did they preach to them? No. Come on back next week and see what we got next week. There you go. Peanuts and popcorn and prizes and clowns and balloons and all kinds of... Listen, here's the point. That is not what church is about. Think about Jonah. Think about Noah. You know what the Bible says about Noah? He was a preacher of righteousness. Well, I don't think his methods were that nice. 
I mean, think about this, guys. I don't think, uh, listen, listen, I've heard these arguments about preaching. It's not effective. People will, they're not going to want to hear somebody get loud. They're not going to hear what the Bible says. Hey, listen, here's what I can tell you, and I mean this in sincerity. If that's not what you want, I, I pray that you eventually come around to seeing this thing the right way biblically. Not my way, but biblically. But if that's what you want, there's, there's a lot of other places out there that are going to give you an environment where you're not going to get preached at. But you know what you need here? You know what I'm going to tell you what we're going to get here by the grace of God? Preaching. Amen. Preaching. It's foolish to the world. Of course it is. Guys, think about this. A guy building a boat the size of three football fields, and it's way high. And, and what's a boat? We've never seen a boat. What's rain? What is that? And then the Bible says of him, everybody knows him for building art. But you know what the Bible says about him? He was a preacher of righteousness. You know what that tells me? He's hammering away on those nails. He's putting that thing up there. And as he's working and constructing that ark, he's saying, you better get right. The rain is coming. You know what they did? They laughed. Well, I don't think that was very effective, Noah. I mean, after all, how many converts did you have? Well, I didn't have many, just my family. Well, that's a failure of a ministry, not in God's eyes. Because he did what God asked him to do. He was a preacher of righteousness. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 21. You say, it's a foolish thing. It sure is. But God commissioned this thing. God chose this method. 1 Corinthians 1. Look at verse number 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. You can read about that in Romans chapter 1. It pleased God. Let me tell you what you ought to learn to do as a Christian. You ought to learn to find out what it is that pleases God and do it. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. That includes us. So if God says, hey, look over here, let me highlight this for you, spotlight, let me tell you what pleases me, I think we should pay attention. And God says it pleased Him by the foolishness of preaching to save them to believe. You say, it's crazy to think of a church being built by this, by the Word of God. Just, isn't there something else? Don't you have to do something else? Well, no, this is it. This is what we should be coming for. This should be the center. Why? Because even though it's foolish to the world, God says, this is what I want to work. This is what I'm going to bless. This is what I'm going to use to minister to your life. And I'm going to talk about some of the blessings of Bible preaching in your life in a little bit. But I want to talk secondly about the characteristics. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 4. The characteristics of Bible preaching. What exactly is Bible preaching? If I need it in my life and it's important to me, why, what, actually, what actually is it made up of? I'll never forget one time. You guys know Brother David Spurgeon. Big, big guy. I remember one time he told a story about going, you know, after he got out of jail and he's got his little daughter with him. She's about four years old at the time. And he's, you know, he's still tatted up and, you know, sunglasses and long hair. And he's a big guy walking through the grocery store. And, uh, and he's in a big brownies with his daughter, you know. And so they're going down the aisle and they're getting the ingredients and they're putting everything in the cart. And they go home. He said he never got so many weird looks. He said, no one ever looked at me that weird when I was at a bar. He said, but man, walking through a grocery store with a four-year-old looking the way I did, getting brownies. He said, now that I look back at it, I guess I, I, I get it. He said, but he got home and they, they unload all the groceries. And they start mixing the brownies, and they start doing everything. And they put the brownies in, they come out, and they are disgusting. <laughs> Awful. And I'm not talking about from scratch. I mean Duncan Hines, Betty Crocker, Pillsbury, in the, you know, pretty easy. And what he realized, whenever he, they started eating, and it was like eating unleavened bread without taste, but it was supposed to be chocolate, and it was terrible. He said, we looked up on the windowsill, and there was this cup of oil. And he said, we realized we had missed a very important ingredient. And can I say this? Preaching is not all about one thing. There's a lot to this book. And there's a lot of different ingredients that God says make up the recipe of preaching. I want to look at that right now. Look at verse number two. He says to the young man, preach the word. He didn't say to share it. He didn't say to psychoanalyze. He said to preach it. Amen. Be instant in season out of season. He's telling the young man, hey, preach when you like to, preach when you don't like to. You know what that means for the hearers? Listen when you like to, listen when you don't like to. Well, pastor, I really wish you wouldn't talk about that. I mean, I'm okay with you talking about my wife submitting to me, but I'm not so much okay with you talking about me having to love her like Christ loved the church. Yeah, I understand that. I get that. Okay? But it's still biblical. Amen? 
in season, out of season. Look what he says. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. I want to break these things down. What exactly is it to reprove? You know what it means? I'll give you a Webster's 1828 definition. It means to blame or to censure. It means to be blamed if you're reproved, to be blamed or be convinced of a fault. Well, that doesn't sound very positive to me. Hey, it's in the book. You know what your flesh needs? Your flesh needs to be told no. And the way that God oftentimes does that, listen, you're not going to get it out there. Man, you turn the TV on and it's you deserve this and you deserve this and you deserve this vacation and you deserve this new outfit and you deserve... Why? Because they're trying to, they're trying to get something out of you, obviously. But the world tells you you deserve and you deserve and indulge and live for the moment and live... And your flesh needs to be told, no, learn to sacrifice for somebody else. Learn to die to self. That's not exactly very positive though, is it? But it's Bible. He says to reprove. Look at 2 Samuel 12. I want to... I want to show you a very good example of this in the Bible. Now, I want you to imagine that there was some sort of secret sin in your life. And that uh, you were trying to hide that secret sin. And Sunday morning, as the Word of God is being preached, instead of me just going through the Scriptures and uh, opening up as we have thus far, I actually walked down, and brother, you're, just, you're, you're right here. So I'm, you're right here, sorry. Okay. And I walk down and I say, this secret sin is going on in your life and you need to get it right. Now most of you would think, once again, he's lost his mind. But I want to show you why I believe God loved David. Look at 2 Samuel 12, and you know the story. He's messed up with Bathsheba. He's done wrong. He's tried to hide it. Man, you think about this, guys. It's a lot like we are. You do something wrong, so you try to cover it up, and you try to get people to go along with your plan so that you don't feel so bad in doing it yourself. You've got someone else. He's got Joab sort of covering things up for him, doing some of his dirty work, so he's going to feel better about it. He's going to hope that nobody else knows about it, but obviously God does. And look at 2 Samuel 12 and look at verse number 5. This is after Nathan, Nathan, the, the prophet of God, comes to him and says, David, let me tell you a story. There was a poor man who had one sheep. There was a rich man who had a bunch. The rich man took the poor man's sheep to feed his guests. What do you think about that, David? And look at what David said. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord liveth, the man that had done this thing shall surely die. Ever come to church and hear preaching about something that's not right in your life? And you think to yourself, boy, my wife needs that. Go ahead, preacher, that's good. <laughs> You ever think, oh man, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, did you see how she was dressed? She needs this message. And you know what? David is doing the same exact thing here. And David goes on, he says, you know what? This man needs to restore the guy. He needs to give fourfold back. And look at verse 7. And Nathan said to David, thou art the man. You know what he did? He put his finger in his face. He said, you are the man. You did the wrong thing. Now guys, let me tell you something. That is hard to take. I'm not going to lie to you. And when the Holy Spirit of God does that, when Bible is being preached, can I encourage you to react like David? Look down, if you would, at verse number 13. After Nathan preaches, that's what he does. He preaches to David. Very personal message. Now listen, guys. I, I assure you, the Holy Spirit does not whisper in my ear and say, that person's doing this. That's not how it works here, okay? God just gives me the word of God and you get fed. But when the Holy Spirit of God comes down in a still small voice as he does, and he puts the finger right there and says, you're guilty. The best thing you could do instead of saying, well, if my spouse hadn't and my kids hadn't and the preacher hadn't done this and this person hadn't said this and my coworker hadn't done that, I wouldn't have. Instead of doing all that, you know what you ought to do? Be like David. Look at verse 13. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. He said, what is that? He got reproved that day. You know what we need sometimes when you come to church? To be told, hey, it's you. The problem is you. You say, oh, man, that's so mean. That's so, how can you dare you say that? You know what the Lord does to me before I ever get up here? As I'm looking over what I'm supposed to preach, the Lord says, you know, you're guilty of that. Yep, I'm wrong. And I'm sorry, Lord. And I don't want to be religious and fake about this, Lord. I'm wrong. I've done wrong. Please forgive me. I want to be a blessing to these people. I can't if I have sin in my life. Lord, please, I'm sorry I'm wrong. Say, what is that? I need that. What does that come from? The Word of God. Reprove. How about this? 
to rebuke. You know what re rebuke means? It means to check or to restrain. Can I say this? You need a preacher and you need preaching that will preach on pride. That will preach on things that you put before your eyes. That will preach on secret habits you have no business holding on to. You know what people want to stay away from? They want to stay away where, where, the, where the Word of God can be personal. And, and guys, as by the grace of God, as long as God gives me the ability to stand here, I want it to be personal in your life. I want it to be pointed. Listen, I'm not trying to hurt anybody, but when the Word of God says something, it's good for you to take it. The Bible says of David, it is good for me that I have been chastened of the Lord, that I have been afflicted of God. God does that. Listen, you know, that's one of the greatest ways for you to take correction, for me to take correction, is from the preaching of the Word of God. What a better way than for you to say, I'll do it my way, and for God to proverbially take you behind the woodshed and deal with you as he does his children. Much better to come to church and hear the Word of God preach and go, ah, that hurts, that stings, but I need that. And Lord, you're right. When's the last time you turned on the TV and saw Joe Osteen preaching on laziness? When's the last time you turned on the TV and saw any great preacher on TV preach on sin? You say, why is that? Because you've got to keep it positive. Hey, guys, I believe in being positive about the Bible. I believe in being positive about heaven. I believe in being positive about the Lord. The things that are right, we should be positive about. And we should be excited about. I mean, when somebody gets saved, it shouldn't be, amen, praise you. Amen. Hey, you've got to raise. Woo! But somebody got to say, Amen. Man, I think we ought to be excited about things that are positive scripturally. But things that are not right, you know what you don't need from me? You don't need me to make you feel comfortable in your sin. What a great disservice I would be doing. Can you imagine getting to the judgment seat of Christ and, and looking at the rewards that God wanted to give you and because of turning off the preaching that was against your sin and saying, I'm not going to listen to that, I'm not going to hear that, I'm not going to adhere that in my life, I won't apply that. God's saying you missed out on this. You know what the Lord wants to do? He wants to learn to help silence your flesh and put the old man in check by rebuking from the word of God. I don't know about you, but I'd much rather have this sort of rebuke and then get into the judgment seat of Christ and him saying, hey son, you know those places where I was trying to talk to you? These are the words I wanted to give you. You don't get them. You know what it says in Revelation chapter 3? Jesus Christ says this, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Yeah. How many parents in here have told your kids some hard things before? And when you tell them those hard things, you say, Listen, I'm not doing this because I hate you. I'm not doing this because I want to hurt you. I'm doing this because I what? I love you. Listen, the Lord is not sitting up there in glory with thunderbolts and lightning bolts in his hand going, Yeah, I wanted to just zap them. He sees the infection of sin in your life, and he sees it spreading like a cancer. And he says, if you can just get there on Sunday morning, I'll help you. I'll give you what you need to overcome that sin. I'll let you know how dangerous, I'll open your eyes to it. I'll rebuke you, because I love you. That's the Lord's work. But can I say this? It's not just about reproving and rebuking. You need to be exhorted. You know what an exhortation is? It's to be encouraged in the word of God. How many times you come to church and you just feel like, man, I can't take one more day. I can't take one more step. And God gives you exactly what you need to encourage you and lift your spirit. Ever happen to you? Well, I pray it does. What is that? That's exhortation. Look at Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. These are the characteristics of Bible preaching. Uh, can, I, can, I, can I point this out to you? If your car only has... Positive energy coming off the battery, you will not be going anywhere anytime soon, right? You need negative and positive. But the truth also persists on the other side. If it's all negative and there's no positive, you don't move forward. Listen, it's important for you to know where you failed and what's wrong and how dangerous sin is and how it taints your life and how it separates you from God. But you need to be exhorted and told, hey, that's not the end of the story. Amen. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us, right? I can do all things through Christ Jesus with strength. We you know what that is? That is an exhortation. That is a reminder to you that you can do what God's asked you to do. You can be a faithful Christian. Look at Titus 1. Look at verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort, that's to encourage, and to convince 
the gainsayers. You need exhortation. Listen, I hope when you come to church, you see it as sometimes, man, I just need a cool drink of water for my thirsty soul. That's Bible preaching. You know, think about this, guys, the gospel. Christ died for our sins. Died, negative. Sins, negative. He was buried, negative. Ah, but he rose again, positive, right? You know what the Lord does with preaching? He says, okay, guys, uh, let's imagine, let, let's do this. Let's take construction. I'm not a construction guy. You want to know about construction? Maybe see Brother Joel, maybe Brother Gene. I, I'm not constructing, but here's what I do know. I know this much. If you go to a piece of land and you've got trees all over the place and you don't take the time to cut them down before you try to build a house, you've got a problem, right? You've got to clear the land, maybe blow some of that out, uh, move some of that junk out of the way, uh, get the stumps out of the way. That is all negative work. That's hard work. That's clearing the way for something better to be put in its place. You know what that reproving and that rebuking does in your life? It allows you to say, God, you're right, I'm wrong. Let's get this way clear so you can build something in my life. And that's what he chooses to do with exhortation. Can I say this, though? He also goes on to say, with all long suffering and doctrine. You know what most people say about doctrine? I read this on the Internet uh, yesterday. Doctrine divides, but Christ unites. Doesn't that sound sweet? Here's the problem. Christ is the one who gave doctrine. Okay, so for someone to say, well, I just don't think we should talk about doctrine. I think that separates us. I think if, if we just got rid of doctrine, you know what happens when you get rid of doctrine? When you blow out any final authority in the word of God, any kind of structure that God gives us as far as what is right and what is wrong for the church and doctrine, when you do that, everything else comes in. Let me put it to you this way. The greatest attack on our children in public education today is they don't learn history about America. Why is that a big attack? Because if they don't know how great their history is, there's going to be a vacuum there. And something is going to fill that vacuum. Have you guys looked at Europe? Do you know what's growing like wildfire fire in Europe? Islam. Among Europeans. I'm not talking about the immigrants. Among Europeans. Why? There's a vacuum. When you take kids and you tell them, oh, man, we were terrible and we did this bad and this was wrong in our history and this, but, but all these other cultures, they're great. And they don't learn anything great about their own history. They don't learn anything about where they came from. There's a vacuum there. Same thing scripturally. Same thing spiritually. I mean, I believe the church right now, this morning, most of us would probably lean right a little bit politically, and we'd be the first to say, our kids should know history. They should know we're Americans. They should know what this is. What about spiritually? Should we not know what sound doctrine is? When that is not there, there's a vacuum, and something will fill it. Can I tell you guys? Why certain movements have taken over in the church as a whole? Because this has been dropped. And when this is removed, and you have no idea what doctrine you believe and why you believe what you believe, you don't know what it is to have sound doctrine, something fills that place. Think about this. 1 Timothy 4.13, I'll just read to you. Till I come, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. 1 Timothy 4.16, take heed unto thyself, and unto the doctrine continue in them. Doctrine is important. Can I say this? Preaching should not avoid subjects like once you're saved, you're always saved. Eternal security. Uh, preaching should not avoid cultural sins. Why? Because Romans chapter 1 is just as applicable today as the day that it was written. Amen. Listen, preaching should not avoid whether we speak in tongues or not. I had somebody tell me a, a, a few months back, well, I just think you're, this, you're, you're a little bit too hard on other groups. Hey, let me ask you this. Parents, if you think that something is going to hurt your kids, do you tell them to stay away from it? I hope you do. I hope you do. You know what God's entrusted me with? His children. To try to help them. And you know, I, I see all around me, I see Christians being drug off into false doctrine. And Christians being sucked into churches where the Bible is being thrown out. Why? Because preachers are too afraid to tell them this is right and this is wrong. This is sound doctrine and this is not sound doctrine. Preaching shouldn't avoid subjects like what is proper for worship music. Preaching shouldn't avoid subjects. Here's one. Ooh. Here's one. Husbands, what is your role? Wives, what is your role? Oh, preacher, don't go there. 
Fathers, what is your responsibility? Mothers, what is your responsibility? Hey, hey, uh, don't go there. Listen, listen, you can talk about all this other stuff and how wicked that stuff is, but once you talk, hey, that's sound doctrine. Let me show you something. Look at Titus chapter 2. Some of you looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. Titus chapter 2, let me show you this. Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, and uh, look here, if you would, at, oh, verse number 3. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. What does it say there at the end of that verse? You know, you know what you think of blasphemy? Someone took God's name in vain. How about you not knowing what sound doctrine is as it relates to your role as who you are in your family? Oh, I'll tell you, I've listened to preachers tiptoe around this stuff. Well, you know, you, you know it's okay if you guys are sort of the same and you know, you're co-equal. And then, listen, listen, we're equal in Christ. But at the end of the day, you know who gives account for my family? I do. And you know what people don't want to hear? That. What is that? That's sound doctrine. I didn't make it up. The book wrote it. God wrote it. Oh, that's just cultural. Isn't that funny how you pull that card whenever you want to? Is God's love cultural? Well, no, that sort of transcends every... Oh, does it? So when he tells the early church to follow something that it's sound doctrine, should we not follow it today? I believe so. Sound doctrine. You know what the Bible says about Jesus Christ? They were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught them as one that had authority. You know what people don't like about preaching? A lot, of, a lot of modern Christians. And you know why they don't like it? Because they're not exposed to it. <coughs> Let me put it to you this way. If every night for dinner your parents scooped up two bowls of Turtle Trails ice cream with hot fudge drizzled over it, peanuts, am I getting some of you hungry? Put some cherries on there. And then all of a sudden you go to Grandma's house and she's got vegetables and she's got uh, casserole and she's got stuff that, man, most people say, well, that, that, that should be good. But the kid never ate it before because all he had was junk food. When he's exposed to really good food, what does he say? Eh, it's not a surprise to me that modern Christians today don't value preaching. They haven't been exposed to it. But, man, when you get exposed to what God can do in your life through the Word of God, being preached, unadulterated, not uh, uh, censored, if you will, you know, people talk about, oh, man, we don't need to censor anything. Just, you know, let's be raw. Let's be open. Let's be natural about it. Let's be organic about it all. Just let everything, hang, all the natural, just put it out there. Everyone likes that except for with the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Yeah. I don't want us to censor the Word of God. I think the Word of God ought to censor us. You know what the word preacher means? It means a herald. In ancient times, a herald was, I don't mean herald like H-A-R-O-L-D, some guy's name, Okay. Yeah. Herald as an H-E-R-A-L-D, someone who would go out and, and proclaim something. In ancient times, a herald was an official spokesman for a king or a general. A herald would make public proclamations on behalf of the king. And that's my role. And I hope that's a blessing to you. But can I say this? Go back to 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Can I say that there is a change today in Christianity in the attitude towards preaching? We see a commission from God. We see the characteristics of preaching. But can I say this? There's a change. And what I pray for for our church is as, as the world continues to suck a lot of Christians with it, that we would stand firm and that much more on the right side of this issue. Why, how do we value preaching? As other churches continue to skim back on the service and skim back on the service and skim back on the service, do we say, well, preacher, I think if you go over 20 minutes, you're done. And I checked you out. Someone was jokingly nodding their head back there. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> All right, but if, if, that's, if that really was your case, can I tell you something? I cannot in 40 minutes undo the junk that was pumped in your mind this week. So how in the world do you expect to get victory in your life over sin and walk closer with God when you continually try to scale back and scale back on the thing that's going to help you to get there? Look at verse number 3, 2 Timothy 4, verse 3. There's a change towards the attitude of preaching. For the time will come, and the guys, I honestly believe we're there, when they will not endure sound doctrine. <laughs> Why? It's judgmental. Why'd you have to say it like that? I mean, could you say it another way? You know what's amazing? 
You see a coach yelling at those people, and man, you don't think anything of that. You see a, a, a drill sergeant yelling at those soldiers, you think nothing of that. Guys, do you understand the analogies the Apostle Paul gives us as Christians? We're like boxers. We're like marathon runners. We're like soldiers. And yet when somebody actually acts like you would in an athletic exercise or a military exercise, you go, I don't like that. You know what that is? That's the wrong viewpoint of what we are as Christians. There's a change in the attitude. Listen to this. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. You know what's going on all over Christianity, starting here in our own country? You know what's going on? People are saying, we don't want to hear that preaching stuff. We just want to hear this guy who tells us what we like. There's a story in the Old Testament where they say, prophesy unto us smooth things. In other words, preacher, tell me I'm okay, you're okay, we're all good. Tell me that everything that I choose in my life is right. Uh, uh, preacher, if you would, just, just tell me that, that the decisions I make are always... Uh, preacher, just tell me about how to be a better me and a more successful me and how to make more money, be financially... That's what I'd like to hear about. And listen... If that's what you want, I'm sorry, that's not Bible. God did not promise you wealth. And God did not promise you success in every area of your life. What he promised was he'd never leave you nor forsake you. He promised that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That's some exhortation. There's a change in the attitude towards preaching. Why? I don't want preaching. I want teaching. Have you heard that before? Well, I don't think you need to preach. Just teach. Can I say this? I believe biblically they're different. You know why? One is spelled P-R-E-A-C-H. The other is spelled T-E-A-C-H. They're different. Amen? The Bible says Jesus Christ went about doing good, healing all manner of sicknesses and diseases, preaching and teaching. I'm not saying that you don't have both. You know what Sunday school is? Teaching. You know what this is? Preaching. <laughs> and listen, I'm going to tell you right now what people like. They like a guy to sit down and get the cup of coffee. Boy, get the coffee table up and sit there and just, you know, guys, this week, I just felt the Lord tell me this, and how do you feel about that? And isn't God good? Doesn't he just love us all so much? Now, guys, first off, yes, he loves us. Yes, God is good. But you know what happens when I turn the lights dim and I start talking to you in this voice? Guys, it is unrealistic. It's not even normal life. Yeah, amen. They're trying to make the church a, psycho, a, 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 a counselor's couch. That is not what this is. The Holy Spirit will counsel you, but I am not, and a preacher is not supposed to be a psychologist. Yeah. We don't turn the lights down dim and get the setting right so that everybody feels okay emotionally. You know what the Holy Spirit wants to do? He amen. wants to turn the light on, on. and shine the amen. light bright on your sin so you can get closer to Him. And I'm sick of that stuff. Amen. And I'm sick of Christians who look at me like I'm the weirdo. <laughs> and say, I mean, God, okay, let me, let me put it to you this way. Who was here first? <laughs> I can tell you this, 50 years ago, you have a guy do that and they call it church. They would have run the guy out of town. That's not church. And that's not preaching. And I'm not just doing this to pick on other crowds or other peoples. That's not the point here. The point is you've got to be careful because you know what happens? You turn on 90.5 or 91, whatever, 91 point, whatever it is, you know, whatever the Christian channel is, and you hear guys talk like this and tell you what the Word of God says. And he never raises his voice, and therefore they think that is preaching. Now, if I talk to you, Brother Wayne, like this, and dear brother... Would you not open? You would say, man, what's wrong with you? You would think I'm fake, but a guy does it on the radio and you think it's normal. It's not normal. <laughs> you say, what is that? They're trying to cover it up. They're trying to make it all just comfortable. We're just all on the same level and I'm okay and you're okay. No, 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 no. I'm here to preach you the word of God. And you know what the Holy Spirit's supposed to do? Convict you of sin. That's good. Hey, have you ever had a cut on your hand and put hydrogen peroxide in there? Did it make you feel warm and fuzzy down inside? Or did it hurt? It hurt. You know why? Because it was cleaning the junk out. And I'm going to tell you, like I said earlier, man, in 40 minutes in a message, there's no way to undo what's going on out there. But man, it can be a help to you. And I can tell you there's a change in the attitude toward preaching. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 
Almost done. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. I watch these guys occasionally. I'll go on YouTube just for the fun of it to see what these jokers are saying and doing. And you say, man, I can't believe you talk that way. Um, read the New Testament. And you know what Paul does? He talks about Hymenaeus. He talks about uh, uh, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. <laughs> he names people. <laughs> he does what most preachers, oh, we shouldn't do that because that divides. Hey, can I tell you something? The person that divides the body of Christ is the one that moves away from truth, not the one that points out what truth is. Amen? Amen. Parents in here, if you make a rule that's for your kid's, your, your kid's safety and for their, their benefit, and they go against that rule, and you point out to them, are you dividing the house, or did they when they disobeyed? I think you know which way you're going to go on that. And yet, when it comes to the preaching of the truth from the Word of God, people say the one that points out truth is a divider. I say it's the other way around. Look at Second Thessalonians. Look at chapter 2. I want to show you something. In verse number 3, what is going on around us right now is something that we oftentimes call, in prophecy, this word called apostasy. And it basically means what we're about to read. Verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, talking about the day of the, of the Lord Jesus coming back, second advent, shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Hey, can I point something out? You can't fall away from something if you were never there. This is not a reference to the world. Guys, the world is never like preaching. Can I say this? 50 years ago, lost people may have at least respected it. Now they joke about it. They didn't like it, but they respected it. Now what you have is Christians not only not respecting it, but saying, we don't want it. You say, what is that? That's a falling away from the truth. It's being somewhere and knowing what is right, and little by little, and guys, can I say this? The change that I'm talking about is always gradual. It's first off, don't point out personal sins. Then it's, does it really matter what Bible you preach from? Then it's, is it okay to change the name from this to this? Then it's, you know, the music's a little stuffy, we like this. And then before you know it, it's a totally different thing altogether. What is it? It's gradual. What is the old analogy? You put a frog in a pot of water and slowly turn the heat up, right? You don't put it at 500 right away, you slowly do that thing. And eventually that frog is swimming to its own death. You know what Christianity is doing today? They're swimming to their own death. And the church is dying because there's a lack of preaching of truth. You know what's going to come in its place? You may not like what I'm about to say. I'm going to tell you it anyways. You know what's going to come in the place of churches standing on truth? Look at Europe. An Islamic invasion. I don't say it because I hate them. I love those people. I work with one of them. I pray he gets saved. But I'm telling you right now, that will fill the void because Christians don't want truth anymore. And eventually, a couple of generations later, the young men are going to say, man, this thing is soft. There's nothing to it. There's nothing to stand on. There's no definition to it. I want something real with some substance. I like what they're saying over there at the mosque. It's happening in Europe all over the continent. It'll happen here too. Unless God's people have an awakening of some sort and say, we need this. And we desire this. And we crave this. We don't just endure it. We enjoy it. You know what I pray I have? I pray that our church is a church that says, Preacher, let it rip. <laughs> and if it hurts me and I don't like it, I'll just take it. And you know what? Rip my face off. Let God do what he wants to do. And I'll come back again for some more. <laughs> Not because of me or I need to feel good about it, but for your own sake. So God can do something in your life. There's a change going on right now. I read an article. This guy's a youth pastor. He goes, six things we need to learn from youth about preaching. Now, first off, can I ask you a question? Adults in here. You think there's a reason why you don't get a license till you're 16? Why you can't vote till you're 18? Why you can't drink till you're 21? Now, I'm not saying I agree with all the different ages brackets. I, some of those could be moved out a little bit further, you know. But here's the point. Not everybody at the, you can't ask a 10-year-old to drive, right? Wow, that's impossible. Well, some were tall enough to do it. Why not? Cognizant-wise, there's some things they haven't developed yet. So for us to go, you know what? Uh, you know, I know we're old-fashioned, and this stuff is just not working anymore. And uh, Ariana, could you just tell us what we need to make this church better? I mean, we just need to listen to the voice of youth. You know what they said? They said, don't raise your voice when you preach. You know what you have? You have a group, a generation that has never been told no. You know how you know? Go to Walmart. Yeah. <laughs> we always call it the Walmart brat. And usually we're in line, and all of a sudden you hear an exorcism going on on the other side of the store. <laughs> you know why? Mommy said the dreaded two-letter word, no. And so all of a sudden, ah, 
ah, you hear that? What is that? That's a sign of our generation. What you have is generations who've never been told no and they've never been spoken to sternly. So when they come to church and they see somebody do this, I go, what are you, who do you think you are? That doesn't make me feel comfortable. I don't like how you're talking. I, don't, I think you should stop. You know, they don't understand it. Why? Because a couple generations ago, some doctor named Spock, you know, he said, if you tell them no, it's going to hurt their feelings, and it'll hurt their self-esteem, and it won't be good for them. You know, I've learned quite the opposite. The child that's learned no is the child that understands self-restraint. The child who has some kind of boundaries in their life, and they enjoy life. And they're not a dread to everybody around them. You say, what is that? I'm trying to point something out because this thing says this. If you're personally vulnerable, we'll listen to what you have to say. In other words, if you say, well, listen, guys, I'm not preaching at you. I'm just preaching to all of us, including me, then I'm okay with it. Hey, can I say sometimes, I'm preaching at you because I love you. You say, when do I get preached at? When I'm making the message. And God says, Adrian, do you not see how hypocritical you are? You better get that thing right with your life. Yeah. How about this one? Sometimes you talk as if we're not in the room. We want, to be, we want to be able to talk as well. Guys, can I say this? A church where everybody's talking at the same time, you know what it is? That's confusion. And you know what the modern church is? Hey, you know what? I'll share my thoughts. You share your thoughts. One time someone came to a men's, men's Bible study, and they go, I just would like to see more of us share our thoughts. And I said, well, there's a time and place, but I have no problem with that. But you know, sometimes you just need to be taught what the Word of God says and listen. And let it encourage you, and let it exhort you, and let it rebuke you. They said this, we're all postmodern, unlike many of our pastors. So, I mean, don't preach uh, black and white truths. Just sort of show us different ways, and then we'll choose the right one. Doesn't that sound like the book of Judges? Every man doing that which is right in his own eyes. And where did that lead? I think I mentioned this in Sunday school. One time, my pastor in Tennessee was at a Starbucks, and there was one of the deacons. They're talking Bible, and this guy walks up to him and says, are you guys Christians? And then, yeah, you know, and they started talking. And the guy, the guy was genuinely saved. He was born again. And, it, and, and the pastor said, well, tell me about your church. He goes, oh, man, the band is awesome, and the music just pumps you up. And, and we have great fellowship, and, 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 and uh, we just love our church, and it's so great. And he said, what about the preaching? He goes, um, we're working on that. You know, you know what that was? It was a nice way of saying, it doesn't really matter. What, what is that preaching? What do you mean? What would that matter? I mean, that doesn't pump me up. It doesn't make me feel good. You say, what is that? It's the wrong view of what it is in your life. And there's a change in the attitude towards that. Can I say this lastly? There needs to be a commitment towards preaching. You need to learn to receive the word of God as the Thessalonians. The Bible says, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing. That when you receive the word of God, you receive it as it is in truth, not the word of men. But as it is, in truth, the word of God. Look at Nehemiah chapter 8. You need to learn to receive it. Can I say this? We need to learn to revere it. I was watching a news conference yesterday. I was at, uh, uh, went to, to, anybody ever go out to Bennett? And you want to come see me in Bennett? Let's go to High Plains Diner. We're at High Plains Diner for lunch. And we're sitting there. And don't you get frustrated when they go, the president's about to speak. And they put the camera and like for the next 15 or 20 minutes, nothing happens, and he's not even there. That frustrates me. I don't know why. But anyways, we're sitting there, we're waiting, and finally he comes in. And when he comes in, everyone, shh. And whenever the judge walks in the room, everybody stands, and they sit down. Now listen, you better understand what I'm saying here. I'm not saying to do that for me at all. I'm a sinner, and I deserve none of that treatment. I mean, I think people that clap for a pastor when he preach that, ugh, yuck. Don't clap, please. Say amen if it's a blessing to you. All right? I'm not performing here. That's not the point. But I'm saying the reverence that is had for the position about what's going to be said because of who that person is. This is the Lord Jesus Christ this morning ministering you through the Holy Spirit of God. And there should be some reverence to that. Look at Nehemiah chapter 8. Now, I have everybody stand on Sunday mornings to read a few verses. But if you read the whole entire story here, we're not going to do that. They stand for it a lot longer. <laughs> And Ezra opened the book, verse 5, in the sight of all the people. For he was above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. You say, what was that? That was just a sign. It's not so much that you have to stand, but it's a sign of reverencing this and the place that this has in your life. There needs to be a commitment to receive the preaching of the Word of God in your life.
There needs to be a commitment in your life to revere the preaching of the Word of God. Can I say this? There needs to be a commitment in your life to allow it to refresh you. You know what the Bible says in the book of Amos? That there's going to be a famine in the land, not for food or for water, but for the words of God. And you know what this is? This is a time to get together and let the Word of God minister to you and refresh you. And I pray it does. I pray this morning, listen, I don't know that we need to have an invitation. I say we all stand, every head bowed, every eye closed, and we'll just be dismissed in a word of prayer. But what I ask you to do, and what I, what I pray that you do, is that you are committed. Listen, I'm, I'm going to make a commitment to you this morning, church, okay? I don't know that all of our church is here, but for those of you that are here, I want to make this commitment. My commitment is to preach to you the Word of God. And I'll pr- commit to doing that until God takes me home. That's my commitment. My commitment. My, my prayer is that you're committed to the preaching of the Word of God as I'm making a commitment to preach it. That you might love it, that you might receive it, that you might revere it, it might refresh you, and that you never get to the place where you go, oh, well, Sunday morning, got to go to church. But that you remember what God can do through the preaching of His Word in your life. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and have a word of dismissing prayer. And I'm going to ask... Uh, Uh, Dad, if you would, close us in a word of prayer.